Thank you. Would it be all right if I just use that handheld? Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you folks and hope that uh, the tale I have to tell you is of some benefit. I um, decided after graduating from law school back in 1977 that um, I was going to practice law for a very long time, but I also decided that um, the real estate investing I'd already done was good and that I should do more of it. I bought my first house when I was 22 and my first office building and apartment building when I was 25. That's it, and uh, I still work there every day when I'm not traveling. And uh, I noticed that a lot of people who gained high levels of prosperity acquired real estate and held on to it for a long time. You don't even have to be very smart if you hold on to it for a long time, <laughs> if you make investments that are not completely insane. So uh, with that in mind, I, I began making decent money for the first time, like most people do after they graduate from college or uh, professional school. And I kept living sort of a student-y lifestyle, which meant I was spending a lot less than I was making. That was not as fun as it might have been, but I, I took the extra money and had as my plan to try to pick up one or two properties a year. And after going to the University of Oregon for both undergraduate and law school, go Ducks, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to see at least some pockets of enthusiasm. <laughs> anyway, I, I stayed in Eugene. Uh, this office is located just a few blocks from downtown and a few blocks from the University of Oregon. I like to run, so um, as it turned out, I think uh, as the years went by, I came to know as much about campus area housing as anybody. And um, I, I picked a bunch of places that were the best I could afford, but they were kind of really worn down places, small apartment complexes, things like that. And I did my best to be a good steward of these properties over the years, but they were really coming to the end of their useful economic life for the most part uh, back about 2005, 2010. And so I know the common reaction to people when I tell them that I began my development career in 2008 is to say, I'm so sorry, did you have to go bankrupt? And it didn't work out that way for me at all for a couple of uh, fundamental reasons that I had nothing to do with. One is that um, the housing type that I chose to specialize in initially was student housing and education ran counter-cyclical to the general economy in that enrollment increased rather dramatically at schools all across the country, including the University of Oregon. So we had a lot of demand. Another good thing that worked in my favor was that most of the housing stock around the university was really quite outdated. Students want to live on the west side of campus. Most of the newer housing stock down there was across uh, the river uh, by Autzen Stadium in the Chase Village area. And once new good quality housing became available on the west side of campus, it was full, rents were rising, um, so life was good. Anyhow, uh, to get into the development phase of my life, which like I say, I never really planned to be a developer, I just started noticing that a few new places were beginning to go up and they seemed to be full. Initially, the economics of that eluded me altogether. I, I couldn't understand how you could make money by building a new building and, uh, because I, I just thought it was so expensive. Wrong. <laughs> it proved to be uh, good business, but it, it proved to be a lot more than just good business. Let's go to my first project that I finished. It was a uh, about a two and a half million dollar project, three-story townhouses, uh, more interesting architecture than you, s you were seeing at the time because I really cared about design and it was an important goal of mine to have these places be uh, well received um, by the community and the neighborhood. Being a longtime resident of Eugene, I think um, it's a lot more important to have something you're proud of than to make a ton of money. And uh, if you can accomplish both, all the better. So this project has a solar array toward the back, and it was one of the first four structures in Eugene that the Oregon Department of Energy decided to highlight when they did a tour of Eugene uh, 
real estate projects that were environmentally forward in an, en in an energy sense in some way or other. So that was completed in 2008, and uh, the next project that I finished was very much like this one, and just one block away. This was an apartment building that I bought in 1986 that my children lived in when they were going to college, and they said, Dad, I don't think you know how badly your property sucks. <laughs> and by the way, how poorly it's being managed. And uh, they were right. And so after finishing, well, before finishing the first project, Coho, uh, it seemed really obvious to me that it would be a good move to tear down the building that my kids had been living in and put up a very similar project. So again, I went with uh, four bedroom, two bath, three story townhouses with uh, lots of sustainability features, like strong adherence to green building practices, and these places were full right off the bat. And, uh, and so even though I only planned to do a couple of these things and then call it a day, what I discovered in the process was I liked this. Uh, and again, I'm not talking about the money making part, I'm talking about uh, the creative process, the act of um, formulating a vision for what kind of development you might want to do and working in a collaborative manner with the design team. And what started as a new relationship has now gone on for quite a number of years. I've worked almost exclusively with one architecture firm. I have worked exclusively with one general contractor. Um, it, is great to get to know these people well. It's really great when you become their most important client because you know you can trust them. They know that if they don't perform, they lose their spot on the team. And uh, believe me, they want to stay on the team because things are going well. So anyhow, first two projects finished in 08. I decided to do a couple of more in 09, and they were similar projects in terms of their scale. The next one, um, it was called Indigo Place, departing from my fish theme for just a moment. Uh, this was from a place that I had bought in the late 80s from a lady who was born there in 1915. It was kind of a nice house, and I had spent a lot of money making the house nicer just a year before I decided to tear it down. And the reason I accelerated my plans to do that are they might be interesting to you. Once some of the neighborhood associations around the university observed that there was a wave of new student housing going in, they didn't like it. And they got the city council to try to kill developers through a death by a thousand cuts, uh, doing things like increasing setbacks, reducing building heights, increasing parking requirements, techniques that are becoming increasingly popular in Portland as well. Anyhow, uh, this particular one has about 30 bedrooms and only a half a dozen parking spaces. You, didn't, you don't really need more because it's right next to the University of Oregon. All three of these were right next to the University of Oregon. And so uh, students, if they want to live there, figure, okay, there's um, six units. Every unit gets one parking spot. And if you have more cars than that, just figure out some place to park them that's nowhere close to here because street parking is very hard to come by. Get used to riding on a bike. That's a good thing to do anyway. And so the lack of parking in these places hasn't been a problem. But the reason I bring that up is because back then, the formulas that dictated how much parking you had to have were pretty simple. You had to have one parking space per unit, regardless of the number of bedrooms. So they changed that to a formula now where the number of parking spaces you have is tied to the number of bedrooms in each unit. So it never would have been possible to build a place with this many bedrooms under the um, ordinance that went into effect the day after I submitted my building permit application for this project. Uh, timing is everything. And it wasn't an accident that it happened that way. So I did one other project in 2009, and it was called Kokanee, getting back to my Northwest fish theme, trying to honor our place. Um, and it, it's the smallest project I've done. Uh, if I had to live in any of the projects I have developed, this would be the one, because they're nice, units, the living space is on the third floor, there's a 20 foot distance from floor to ceiling with the, with the uh, vault, and beautiful views out across South Eugene to Spencer Butte, and um, spacious, again, very uh, popular project. So I'd done four projects in two years, I was feeling good about it, and uh, I got 
an off-market opportunity to acquire a much larger site than any of the sites I'd worked on before, a place where the Sons of Norway Lodge had been located. Again, just a block off the University of Oregon campus. And um, it had, oh, let's see, uh, just less than a half an acre. And so on it, just to give you an idea of the scale, these first four projects were all in the vicinity of a million and a half to two and a half million dollars a piece. And they had a total of about 125 bedrooms. The next project all by itself equaled about the same total. It had 112 bedrooms to be precise and 36 units. It was my first building with an elevator. I thought at first, elevators are scary. They're, aren't they really expensive? How can I possibly afford that? But the economics do work out, as I suspect all of you knew before I did. Uh, it was my first place with an underground parking garage, my first place with a bunch of amenity spaces. This is a social area. This is a study area. This is an exercise room. It has an interior courtyard. And um, it had quite a diversity of units, everything from one-bedroom units to five-bedroom units. Uh, and, and the whole range in between. So uh, that one was successful. It was getting a lot harder to get financed in 2008, uh, in 2009 and 2010, but um, somehow we managed to convince banks. I noticed Umqua Bank is a sponsor, so yay for Umqua. They came through for me a few times for most of these first uh, projects that I did. Uh, and these days I'm working with a lot, a lot more banks. But um, when 2011 came, I had acquired a site from the hospital. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Eugene may know that for many, many years, uh, Sacred Heart Hospital right next to campus has been the big hospital in Eugene. And about this time, they moved their facility into Springfield, actually, a beautiful site near the Mackenzie River. So they, to some extent, downsized and repurposed their campus uh, property and had, had some surplus property, one of which was a wonderful piece of land just west of the west gate of the University of Oregon. So when we were struggling to come up with a name for that one, I know it's not very original, west gate, but it happens to be descriptive since it's next to the west gate of the University of Oregon. This one is uh, lead platinum, and it's in the lead for homes mid-rise program, which at the time of this was a pilot program focusing on projects that are four to six stories in height with wood frame construction. It's actually just the second lead platinum building in its category west of the Mississippi, and the first one um, in the Pacific Northwest. So I, I felt really good about that. The other buildings had also been designed to high standards and could have qualified for lead certification, but the um, things that you have to do in terms of hiring the lead consultant, lead application, energy modeling, all these sorts of things are, are quite expensive. So um, in, the, in the case of this project, I just thought that it was an important enough project given its, given its uh, size and proximity to the university that it was worth going to the extra trouble and expense and, and implementing even more green measures in the, in the project to warrant that uh, expense. Uh, a word, by the way, about off-market opportunities, because this project, too, was an off-market opportunity. And about this time, I was kind of hitting my stride, doing more development than um, other folks in our market were doing. And I started getting more unsolicited calls from people in your line of work than I had gotten before. and. One reason I did, I, I don't think it's just because I was active. I think it was, I think it had a lot to do with the fact that I believe very strongly in closing your deals on the time, not playing games in the negotiating process. If somebody wants a fair price for the property and uh, you're given the gift of the first look at it, accept the fair price and close with no BS. And um, it's, a sad fact that I'm sure you know far better than I, that a lot of the people who do this sort of thing feel differently about how you should conduct your business affairs. And I would encourage all of you to, it must, you must be in a weird spot from time to time, uh, maybe not wanting to cross uh, the agenda of a client who wants to be a little bit fast and loose with their ethics uh, in hopes of 
shaving something off the price or buying themselves some more time in order to close. But I think you would be doing uh, the world a big favor to go ahead and counsel them on the value of ethics and how in the long run, if they are straight shooters, it will pay off for them. And, and it certainly has paid off for me because I get more first opportunities. And, uh, and so keep them coming, folks. <laughs> I finished one other project in 2011, it's called The Anthony. Uh, most of these projects won uh, architectural awards too. I, for four years running, I won the award for the top new apartment building in um, our region. And uh, these awards were given by the um, AIA, which is a large region, uh, and it doesn't cover just Eugene Springfield. So it's a big deal. and that was very gratifying to me. So this one has, it's, it's back to the townhouse style, 15 units, something like 54 beds. So the biggest projects I had done up to that point were in the six and a half to seven million dollars range. Westgate and Sonia were of that scale and uh, the university was continuing to grow. I was feeling quite good about this and then an opportunity came up to buy a larger track, three quarters of an acre is quite large for the University of Oregon market. And this is the one that we finished in 2012, which is the, per the Pearl, there it is. It's on the corner of 17th and Patterson to those of you who know the university well. So a little bit farther from the university, uh, it, it would have been darn near impossible to get that big of a piece within a couple of blocks of the university. Uh, but it was close to something, to a few things that students really value. A, a grocery store. B, a Starbucks. And six blocks is really not that far to go to campus. And because it was a large site, um, my, my philosophy about parking was changing at this point. I decided that in some cases, it really is wise to provide not the least amount of parking the code requires, but more than the code requires. And this is an example of that. This property has a 100 unit um, underground parking facility. And it's actually the largest not government backed underground parking facility in the city of Eugene. And you can't imagine how proud it makes me to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, this one has 100 units. It's mixed use, as was Westgate, with retail on the ground floor, and um, it's been full the whole time. So, so I, I hear you've got some spaces for bikes in that also? <laughs> yes, space for, what, it's over 100 bikes. And it's kind of a long, rectangular bike storage space, which would be well suited to a bowling alley. There's that, that much bike parking there. Oh, yes. Uh, thanks, Bob. So there are uh, a number of Asian students coming to the University of Oregon and many other schools around the U.S. these days, as you know. Uh, a lot of them have tremendous amount of disposable earnings because of the uh, generosity of their parents in capitalist China. And so the type of cars, there was an Aston Martin, a Lamborghini, <laughs> BMWs, Mercedes, uh, Land Rovers, uh, Lexus, that stuff's Audis, very commonplace. It's like, oh, you just have an Audi, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's just nuts, Maseratis, um, yeah. And um, yeah, if, if you feel free, Bob, to pump, prompt me with any more tips on information I might bring that would be of interest to this audience. So. The next project, I just, I just kept coming across good sites, and so in 2013, I finished a site that was at a wonderful location on the corner of 18th and University, which is the South Gate to the University. I did not call this one South Gate. <laughs> I was more drawn by the fact that from this property, you can actually watch a track meet at Hayward Field, and thought it would really be nice to honor the memory of some prominent track athlete at the University of Oregon, there being no one better to fulfill that role than Steve Prefontaine. But of course, you can't do that legally without getting the family's permission. And at that point, there was really just one family member, uh, his sister, who could speak for the family. And 
I talked to a number of people who knew her, and they all said, good luck. <laughs> You'll need it, because she, she tends to not be very eager to even talk about the usage of the family name. But as it turned out, uh, she and I had a lot in common, and um, including, oddly enough, that we were all born in Coos Bay. Uh, I found out that we were all delivered by the same doctor within a year of each other. <laughs> And my uh, brother, um, who died 10 years ago, was a writer who wrote over 4,000 columns for Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun-Times. And one of the columns he wrote about was uh, concerning Steve Prefontaine. So how could she say no? <laughs> she didn't say no. Uh, she's become a good friend. And I, so uh, by the way, I went to college with Steve. And I, I knew him. That didn't hurt. Um, I, I can't say I knew him well, but uh, I knew him somewhat, and uh, once when we were handing in our final papers for a class, he noticed that mine was thicker and kind of, it looked to him like it was more, let's just say, well put together, and he wanted to look at it, and uh, he said, wow, I, that's really great. I'd like to invite you to a party sometime, <laughs> which he never did, but that's okay. Anyway, the Prefontaine sits up there on the corner of 18th and University. Uh, we went so far with this one to have metal sculptures created and spent a lot more money on landscape architecture because, again, I felt that in this location, as prominent as it is, it was really important to do something that would be well received by the neighborhood and the community, and it has been. So the market was starting to change at this point. It wasn't just uh, local guys who were building apartments. At this point, um, the Eugene market and all the other major campus markets around the country were being bird dogged pretty heavily by national companies that had a lot of capital they wanted to place. So uh, to those of you who may not be aware of it, we have over 1,000 units created by the Alabama company Capstone at the intersection of 13th and Willamette and 13th and Olive. We have a brand new 12-story building called The Hub with about 600 units created by a Chicago company known as Core Campus. We have 2121 Franklin, which is where the Black Angus used to be on Franklin. Huge, not very pretty project with about a thousand bedrooms that's just been finished. There are a few others that are on the board, a few others I could tell you about, but the, the bottom line is that the university stopped growing. It's stuck at about 25,000. The amount of new housing supply has grown by several thousand units, and we now have an imbalance going the other direction in the supply demand equation. So there are definitely going to be some people who will not fare well in uh, the coming years because there's going to be much higher vacancy factor and uh, there's no reason to foresee that rents will increase. They will likely at best uh, stay flat. Luckily, uh, my particular places are still all full because they're well located, well designed, well received, and I hope that continues to be the case. But I did decide um, in uh, 2013 that it might be a wise move to take some chips off the table and engaged in a transaction with a, the largest private equity holder of student housing in the United States, Harrison Street Private Equity Capital out of Chicago, to sell. I, first, I just wanted to sell one of them. They said, how many, how many units is that? How many bedrooms? I was thinking Sonia, 36 units, 112 bedrooms. They said, not enough. Well, how much do you need? They wanted 400 units. So in order to put together a package that would interest them, uh, the properties that were involved in that transaction were, if you've been paying close attention, Pearl, Anthony, Westgate, and Sonia for a total of almost 400 beds. And um, every year in the Register Guard, they put out a list of the largest real estate transaction that happens in Lane County, and, and I'm glad that the Register Guard didn't have all the facts on this one, uh, because this, this would have been the biggest one for quite a few years running, and uh, they paid a record low cap rate, so that enabled me to recapitalize and also kind of rethink my strategy, because it, it just wasn't good business sense anymore to put up more 
projects. But one great, truly great location came my way, again, off-market situation, and it was at the corner of 13th and Patterson, and this is where we developed the Patterson. Again, a mixed-use project, 100 units, mostly studios ones and twos, underground parking, great location, well amenitized with fitness center, community room, rooftop deck, that kind of stuff. It's full. Uh, they're paying rents that are at the top of the market. And uh, I'm pretty sure that this will be my last University of Oregon housing project until the future becomes more clear than it is now. It'll take quite a while for all the new housing stock to be absorbed. So I think somebody would have to be pretty crazy to do more at this juncture. But I will say that people considered me really crazy, especially in the early going because of this architecture that was initially considered way out there uh, because of my interest in uh, spending money to do things that were environmentally forward. Uh, because I was doing so many projects, how can you do more? There's already so much. And um, I, didn't, I didn't really take offense at being called crazy. Uh, because ultimately the, the moves that I made were pretty well validated by the market and um, I feel good about them. But rather than just retire, I found that I continued to really like engaging in this pursuit and there's nothing really magic about student housing. Housing is housing to a large extent. The changes from market rate housing to student housing are really not all that great. There's so many common elements involved. So we started researching other markets. Didn't have to research very hard to find the hottest one, Portland, Oregon. So we now have two projects that are underway here. The first one is the Boathouse, which is in John's Landing. Um, it's scheduled to be completed in February. Actually, there are two buildings. The smaller building on the east will probably be done in November. The bigger one in February, it's 133 units. Um, I'm going to keep a really big unit there and uh, start spending uh, a lot of time up in Portland. Who wouldn't want to do that? And I look forward to seeing all of you more as uh, my wife and I live part-time up here. Um, so specifically where this is, is uh, at Boundary and Macadam. So if you're going south of Macadam, turn left on Boundary. You know, the office tower building that was sort of the original John's Landing landmark. So it's a terrific location right between John's Landing condominiums and the brick office building where Ericsson Air Crane is headquartered. So many things are nice about it. You have the bike path right there. You have a marina right there. And um, we were just walking through it earlier today. The, the finishes are excellent. It's well amenitized. We've gotten a tremendous amount of interest even though we haven't done anything to start marketing units yet, but we're about to. And so um, I think our timing on this one was good. Um, here's, here's another view. So you can see Mount Hood. Actually, that's, that's Mount... S Is that Mount St. Helens? That's to the north. Yeah, so there's St. Helens. And uh, there's another view that will show you Mount Hood. It's just, there it is. Um, so I'm very excited about this one. I also acquired a site, again, off market in the northeast Portland area on the corner of 7th and Northeast Russell, where for many years a dilapidated gas station that hadn't been in business for 25 years was located. It was a neighborhood eyesore. Uh, it looked like a crack house. And yet, when there was talk of development, some of the neighbors became strangely fond of that gas station. <laughs> uh, I was on KGW TV a few nights ago. Uh, they interviewed a few of the neighbors who were threatening to chain themselves to the fence. And um, luckily, there was no threat of tree sitting. Uh, our tr we did need to take down some trees, but they weren't massive redwoods. And um, so we, we, it takes a long time to get permitted up here in Portland, as you know. But we did finally manage to get permitted for both the boathouse and our Russell Street project, which we are naming the Elliot because it is located in the Elliott neighborhood. It's actually directly across the street from the west edge of the Irvington neighborhood. So it's a couple of blocks off MLK, quieter there. It's about a half acre site, six stories tall, underground parking, both this and Boathouse will be certified lead gold, has a rooftop deck, fitness room, uh, 
for and, and an activity center. We think it'll be very nice. Again, more parking than the code requires. That's been a hot button issue in Portland, I know. Same with Boathouse, more parking than the code requires. And um, so at the moment, we have actually seven projects in various stages of active construction or planning, and the dollar volume of these projects upon completion will be pretty close to $200 million. Our company is a little tiny company. It's me, Chris Looney, my assistant over here. He's been with me for about a year and a half. Actually, he's my junior partner and uh, my executive assistant. So uh, we don't know how many projects we can do at one time. I hope we don't overdo it, but it feels like we're just hitting our stride and, and really uh, continue to enjoy it. So why not? Uh, the next pursuit that we are undertaking involves senior housing. We have four sites that we have either closed on or have under contract. Um, these, these are in secondary Oregon markets because the research we've done so far leads us to feel that it's a pretty crowded field here in Portland. Same in Eugene, same in Salem, same in Medford, for example, and Bend. So um, the communities that we have uh, targeted all can use another facility, but just one more facility. So the odds that there would be additional competition in any of those is pretty much non-existent because you need to have a market study that supports additional need, and there just isn't additional need beyond what we're going to provide. These facilities will include typically uh, 60 assisted living units and 20 memory care units. Some of them will also have independent living cottages. And uh, this is the landscape architecture plan for the facility that we're going to do in Florence, Oregon. It's an interesting community with only about 8,000 people. But because they have a lot of retirees, it has about the number of retirees that you would expect in a town that's uh, maybe around 25,000 or so. We've partnered with a senior housing company in Eugene, a small company, guys we know really well because even though we know how to build stuff, we don't know how to deliver services for seniors. So I think it would have been pretty dumb for us to uh, go forward on a venture like that without partnering with people who really know the ins and outs of the senior housing business. Anyway, that takes us up to today. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm very happy to answer questions that you might have. Oh, I forgot Bend. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so in Bend, we're also doing a, uh, an apartment project. This is the first one that's more garden style than uh, the method of construction, the style of architecture that I've used in the past because it's a large site. It's a four acre site on the east side of Bend. Uh, we're calling it Bellevue Crossing. For those of you who know beer in Bend well, you may be familiar with Worthy Brewing, uh, which is on the, on the east side, very close to the intersection of Highway 20 and 27th Street, which is kind of ground zero for the east side. That's how you get to the hospital. Uh, there's major uh, retail there. And so for us to acquire that large of a site in that part of town, Bend is uh, very different west side, east side. Most of the renters live on the east side. The vacancy rate in Bend is currently 1.4%. Lots of waiting lists. Uh, lots of businesses that want to expand but can't because they can't attract employees because employees can't find housing there. So we're going to help with that to the tune of 153 units. And uh, we just broke ground on that one within the last few weeks. We're supposed to complete it within about a year. And um, thanks for reminding me about Bend. Is there anything else that I've forgotten? <laughs> Yeah. In your experience in working in Eugene and Portland, you probably saw a run up over the cycle in the cost per square foot of real estate. Could you describe that a little bit to us when you left when your, your last project in Eugene? What did you start paying per square foot and then what did you exit at? When I started, people were really excited in Eugene when uh, the price per square foot for decent campus area property crossed the $40 a square foot threshold. That was thought to be a really, really big deal. And the high watermark 
uh, you can find a transaction or two at about 110 a square foot. Uh, most of the most most of the activity took place in the range of 55 to 70 a square foot. You know, Eugene has a bad reputation for being hard to work with. People say, oh, getting a building permit out of the city of Eugene, that's really tough. Good luck. Ha, ha, ha. And uh, Eugene has gotten better. Portland seems awful to me. I mean, Portland is, it, it is stunning to me how slowly they process things, how irrational some of their requirements are, and, and stunning that they haven't gotten sued a lot more than they do. So I hope that they manage to turn around that culture, hire more people, uh, adopt a different mindset. Seems like there are too many people down there who are afraid that if they say yes, they'll get into some kind of trouble. <laughs> and way too eager to engage in creative obstructionist code interpretation. <laughs> yes? One thing, two things. <laughs> uh, so I don't mind talking about the investigation. So there, there's a property manager in Eugene who was shut down by the state. Uh, there's a criminal investigation pending uh, being done by the FBI. He has been unable to account for somewhere between two and four million dollars. A few hundred thousand of that belongs to myself and my partners. Um, and how I would have handled it differently is make sure that there's a separate trust account for my funds for each property, because then you'll, you'll find out really fast and, and do an excellent job of monitoring the bank account. What this guy did is he would collect deposits and make f dummy entries onto reports to clients so that you would think that the funds were in the uh, trust account, but they weren't. Also, I would pay more attention to insurance. Yeah, yeah. Maybe consider bonding. It is, not, it is difficult to get insurance that covers this type of loss because it's intentional conduct and it tends to be subject to exclusions in policies. And Dan, I know that you've been a victim of the same person. Yep, and, and not believing him when he said so honestly, I'm sorry I bounced that check. It was a terrible mistake by my bookkeeper. Here's the money. Anyway, this guy took in a number of very sophisticated people, uh, among them attorneys and accountants um, who had been in business with him for a long time. So uh, lessons to be learned for sure. Yes? So I've used Earth Advantage. I would use it again. I used Earth Advantage when it was supported by the local utility, eWeb. They did the rating, so it was a cost-free deal. In fact, there were even incentives, so by the time you got your incentive money, it worked out pretty well. Um, I mean, it's really just in terms, it's just not even a rounding error in terms of the amount of money we're talking about, but not having to write checks to get the energy modeling done, not having to write checks for um, green raters and lead consultants. It's nice to not have to write those checks, but I think at the end of the day, lead certification has a lot of credibility. Uh, no, none of the other contenders that have emerged have anywhere near the market recognition or prestige, so if you want to demonstrate 
to the buying public your commitment to going green, I think LEED is still the way to go. Yes. His question was. <laughs> oh, hi, Dan. I'm Beth Dupont. Um, quick question. I mean, we've watched the kind of evolution of what you've done and what's been going on in Eugene on student housing. You have a lot of clients invested in that area. Would you comment on what you think how some of the institutional investors, the building types that they've come on with uh, and locations where they've come on with have impacted the market versus kind of that, I like always call it the golden circle, the west region with the smaller plexes or the smaller units like yours and how they will fare in the market going forward? You okay, sure. <laughs> okay, so you have very, very large student housing plexes or apartments being built. I mean, dorm-like, very, like capstone. They're huge. Um, and then you have, and that's one spectrum of the student housing. Then you have the smaller units, I won't say, uh, you're probably more in the middle of that area, and then you have the mom and pops that are kind of the more of the plexus. Overall, and there's definitely a shakeup going on right now in the um, rents and lifestyle and students and vacancy, and, and how do you think in the long term this is all going to shake out? Um, so at the University of Oregon, how I think it's going to shake out is that some of these huge projects are unlikely to ever achieve the occupancy levels that they modeled in their pro forma uh, because they are poorly located, um, they are architecturally awful, and not the hub, uh, but Capstone and 2121. And, um, and they'll, they probably will sell out to other institutional investors, uh, but there'll be tough negotiations over price. And, but whoever ends up with those properties is going to be stuck with a property that they're not really very likely to be able to get to perform better than the people who came before them. Other losers, if that's what you're asking, the people who have the old housing stock, um, it's, it's, they can just keep dropping their rents, uh, but the, there's still going to be higher vacancy levels by a lot than is healthy, and so some of those mom and pops are going to get seriously hurt. As for people as you say, my, me, in the middle somewhere. Uh, I don't know. Early indications are that things are going to be pretty good given superior locations, w solid maintenance, a lot of local care and attention. Um, the University of Oregon, as you know, is a school that I, I think students care about who owns their place. A lot of them care that it has solid environmental values. And those that don't, Need to start learning. <laughs> One more question. Okay. Have you had a chance or did you ever look at a model in some of the smaller communities that have private institutions, for example, George Fox, Linfield, Whitworth, Whitman, some of those schools? We've looked at those just a little bit. and. Uh, when I, I reach the, there's only so much you can look at. We try to look at lots of stuff. And uh, so if we learned of a great building site and uh, did our research and were convinced that the rent structure in any of those small markets was strong enough to support uh, the economics of a project, we wouldn't hesitate to do one. Our plate's pretty full at the moment, but we're always looking for new opportunities too. Does that answer your question? Yeah.